Good day, everyone. Last time, we have started Article 13 of the Revised Penal Code, which is Chapter 3 on Mitigating Circumstances. Of the many mitigating circumstances, we're done with incomplete justifying, incomplete exempting. You have their minority and over 70 years old. No intention to commit so grave a wrong as that committed provocation, vindication of a grave offense, and passion or obfuscation. Now, you also have to remember that there are two kinds of mitigating circumstances, which are ordinary mitigating and privilege mitigating. And so far, as far as the mitigating circumstances that we have done, Please take note of the requisites of each before the same can be considered to be mitigating that would work to impose the penalty upon the accused in the minimum period. And to continue the same, we have there paragraph 7. Paragraph 7 gives us two mitigating circumstances, voluntary surrender and confession of guilt or plea of guilty. Now take note of the proper term as used in the law. Confession of guilt and plea or plea of guilty. When shall voluntary surrender be considered as mitigating circumstances. As shown in the screen, you have there the requisites that the offender had not been actually arrested, that the offender surrendered himself to a person in authority or to the latter's agent, that the surrender was voluntary. When shall we consider this surrender as voluntary? To be appreciated, the same must be spontaneous in such a manner that it shows the interest of the accused to surrender unconditionally to the authorities, either because he acknowledged his guilt or because he wishes to save them the trouble and expenses necessarily incurred in his search and capture. Meaning to say, after the commission of the crime by the accused, he has to surrender spontaneously from the commission to whom he shall surrender to a person in authority or to the agent of a person in authority so to illustrate voluntary surrender the accused after plunking a bolo into the victim's chest run toward the municipal building upon seeing a patrolman he immediately threw away his bolo raised his two arms, offered no resistance, and said to the patrolman, Here is my bolo, I stabbed the victim. There was intent or desire to surrender voluntarily to the authorities. Now, do not be confused, um, because usually the municipal jail are also situated in the municipal building. That's why in this particular case, he ran toward the municipal building. So after the commission of the crime, he right then and there went to the municipal building in order to surrender. To whom he surrendered patrolman. Who is a patrolman? An agent of a person in authority. So the same is considered to be voluntary surrender. Spontaneous from the time he committed the crime. Then he surrendered right away. Compare this case. The warrant of arrest showed that the accused was in fact arrested, meaning to say there was already a warrant issued against him and it was served upon him. That's why the return of the warrant of arrest to the court, he was arrested. Under this set of facts as shown in this case of El Pueblo versus Conway, the court ruled that the same is not voluntary surrender. In People v. Roldan, the accused surrendered only after the warrant of arrest was served upon him. Same thing, not no voluntary surrender. The accused went into hiding, 
and surrendered only when they realized that the forces of the law were closing in on them. Now, you might be asking, if a warrant of arrest has already been issued against the accused, there is no way that he can avail of voluntary surrender? Not at all. Because there would still be voluntary surrender if you surrender prior to the service of the warrant of arrest. Meaning to say, ikaw ang naguna. Wala pa serve sa police officer ni mo ang warrant of arrest, but you did the first uh, move. You surrender prior to the service. That would still be considered as voluntary surrender. Now, there is also that situation wherein what was surrendered is the weapon used in the commission of the crime. People versus Palo, where the accused merely surrendered the gun used in the killing without surrendering his own person to the authorities, such act of the accused does not constitute voluntary surrender. Voluntary surrender implies surrender of the accused of his person to the authorities. So that is voluntary surrender. People versus Virges. Surrender of weapon cannot be equated with voluntary surrender because what has to be voluntarily surrendered should be the person of the accused. Voluntary surrender refers to the surrender of the person of the accused to a person in authority or his agents. Now, who is a person in authority or his agents? On the board, on the screen rather, is the definition of who a person in authority is, who is an agent of a person in authority. Person in authority is one directly vested with jurisdiction that is a public officer who has the power to govern and execute the laws, whether as an individual or as a member of some court or governmental corporation, board, or commission. Example, mayor, vice mayor, duly elected barangay councillors, barangay captain, duly elected barangay kagawad. Uh, governor, vice governor, provincial board members, congressman, senator, president, vice president, judge, justice, okay, and so on and so forth. Um, in your book, you have there the teachers as well as the lawyers, specifically if it was in the performance of duty, they are considered to be persons in authority. Agent of a person in authority is a person who, by direct provision of the law or by election or by appointment by competent authority, is charged with the maintenance of public order and the protection and security of life, property, and any person who comes to the aid of persons in authority. So, as an example, you have there the barangay tanods, police officers, irrespective of the ranks. In other words, all men in uniform are considered to be agent of person in authority, even the general himself. The general there is only an agent of person in authority because the person in authority is the president. Voluntary surrender simply means the surrender of the accused before his arrest, showing either acknowledgement of his guilt or an intention to save the authorities from the trouble and expense that his search and capture would require to be mitigating to be mitigating the surrender must be by reason of the commission of the crime for which he was prosecuted for what does this last sentence means it could be possible that there is another case pending against you already however you are not yet arrested for that particular crime. And here you are committing another crime. And 
you were arrested right then and there, would that be considered voluntary surrender as far as the other crime is concerned? The answer is no. Because to be mitigating, the surrender must be by reason of the commission of the crime for which he was prosecuted for. How about... No. When is surrender voluntary? In the case of people, people versus Lagrana, must be spontaneous, showing the intent of the accused to submit himself unconditionally to the authorities, either because he acknowledges his guilt, because he wishes to save them the trouble and expenses necessarily incurred in his search and capture. So these are the situations the scenario wherein we can conclude that the surrender of the accused is voluntary because the same was done spontaneously. Now, the second mitigating circumstance under paragraph 7 is plea of guilty or confession of guilt. Under this particular mitigating circumstances, the offender spontaneously confess his guilt. That confession of guilt was made in open court that is before the competent court that is to try the case and that the confession of guilt was made prior to the presentation of evidence for the prosecution. Now, take note that there are instances where a person committed a crime and right then and there he was arrested. And then while inside the jail, reporters or let's say the barangay captain interviewed him and then he admitted to have killed the person for example now that admission is not the plea of guilty or the confession of guilt to be considered as mitigating circumstances take note that it must be spontaneous meaning to say the three requisites must concur must be present Spontaneous. The confession of guilt must be made in open court, that is, before the competent court that is to try the case. So, meaning to say, if he killed a person, he was arrested, and he was subsequently charged in court, and that particular court is the one being assigned to hear his case, that is the court referred to under the second requisite of plea of guilty, competent court that is to try the case and take note of the last requisite was made prior to the presentation of evidence for the prosecution. So what stage of the trial are we referring to? Either when you were arraigned, okay, during your arraignment, when after being read of the information, the court asked you, how do you plea, guilty or not guilty? And you answer guilty. That is confession of guilt. Now, sometimes uh, when you were arraigned because maybe probably of fear, you will answer not guilty. Meaning to say you entered a not guilty plea. And then pre-trial ensued. Can you not avail any more of plea of guilty? You can still avail of it because the Requisite says prior to the presentation of evidence for the prosecution. In other words, it could be possible that on the next setting or the subsequent setting to which the prosecution is about to present evidence, you ask your counsel to manifest to the court that you are to change your plea from not guilty to a guilty plea. Meaning to say, you will be rearranged so that you can enter your guilty plea that would still be considered as plea of guilty. Take note of the accurate term plea of guilty or confession of guilt. Do not use the term admission of guilt because that is not the accurate term because it could be possible that you admitted to have killed the person and yet you offered some justifying or exempting circumstance, meaning to say you made a qualified um, plea. So that is not the plea of guilty 
being referred to under paragraph 7 as a mitigating circumstance. To further illustrate plea of guilty, A was charged for homicide. The same was pending before RTC XXX of Cebu City presided by Judge ZZZ. When his case was calendared for his arraignment, when the same was read to him in the dialect to which he is conversant, he pleaded guilty. Okay, so right then and there, when the charge is being read to him, he pleaded guilty. Do not forget, it must be before trial begins. Before the prosecution shall have presented its evidence made in open court not extrajudicial, meaning to say not outside the court, must be unconditional. You do not say guilty, yes, I admitted to have committed a crime, but it was done in self-defense. So that is unconditional. So that is not the plea of guilty referred to under paragraph 7. Now take note that the same is not applicable in culpable felonies and in crimes punished by special penal laws. Because uh, SPL generally does not have the mitigating circumstances. Next mitigating circumstance is physical defect. When we say physical defect, we are referring to the physical deficiency of the offender either because he is deaf and dumb. It could also be possible that he is blind or otherwise suffering from some physical defect which thus restricts his means of actions, defense, or communication with his fellow beings. In a criminal case charging robbery in an uninhabited house, the accused is deaf and dumb. The court ruled that he is entitled to the mitigating circumstance of being deaf and dumb. Physical defect referred in is such as being armless, crippled, or a stutterer, whereby his means to act, defend himself, or communicate with his fellow beings are limited. Now, what could be the possible logic here? For example, you have their robbery because of your being deaf when someone shouted run because there is a barangay tanod of course the rest of the the accused run it was only you who were arrested because you did not hear or maybe the arresting officers who are pursuing your group was able to to uh arrest you because you are crippled or you are so uh, and, and because of that you are so slow in running so the physical defect there of the accused can is considered to be a mitigating circumstance does the mitigating circumstance of physical defect apply when the deaf mute or blind is educated or the same was used to take advantage, facilitate the commission of the crime. Because it could be possible that the, the, the physical defect of the accused facilitated the commission of the crime. For example, the woman, the, the owner of the house, believe you that you are really hungry, so he allowed you to enter his house. And all the while, when you were there inside, you took her personal belongings. So you were charged of death. Okay, so going back to the question, would it still be physical defect? The answer is yes. It is the principle in criminal law that when the law does not distinguish, we also do not distinguish. Okay, next mitigating circumstance is illness of the offender. To be mitigating circumstances, the following requisites must be present. The illness of the offender must diminish the exercise of his willpower. And such illness should not deprive the offender of consciousness of his acts. Now take note, 
it shall only diminish. It does not deprive him of the consciousness of his acts because if it would fully deprive him of the his consciousness, we can conclude that the same was not voluntary because of lack of intelligence. Here, he still has that willpower, only that it is diminished because of his illness. If the same deprives the offender or he completely lost the exercise of willpower, it may be an exempting circumstance, not just illness as provided under paragraph 9. To illustrate illness, A stab B to which he was charged for serious physical injury. During trial, it was proven that he committed it with some impairment of his mental faculties since he was shown to suffer from the chronic mental disease called schizoaffective disorder or psychosis. Such impairment was not so complete as to deprive him of his intelligence or the consciousness of his acts. So it's only mitigating. Other cases illustrating this kind of mitigating circumstance. Mistaken belief of the accused that the killing of a witch was for the public good to those who have that obsession. They are the same as those who were attacked with a morbid infirmity, but still retaining consciousness of his acts does not have real control over his willpower. People versus Balneb. In People vs. Amit, accused who have mild behavior disorder but still mentally sane, mitigating. Accused who is suffering from acute neurosis and a feeble-minded accused because they still has that capacity. Only that their capacity or their intelligence is diminished. Only mitigating circumstance. In paragraph 10, it refers to similar and analogous circumstances. Similar, analogous to those being mentioned under paragraphs 1 to 9 of Article 13 to mention. From over 70, similar to over 70, you have their over 60 but with failing sight. For vindication of grave offense, you have their outraged feeling of owner of animal taken for ransom. Remember, kanang mga pet owner, oy mas favorite pa na, mas palanga pa na gani kaysa other members of the family. So if you hurt the pet, the pet owner would surely be outraged if ever you will hurt or endure the pet. Outrage feeling of creditor, similar to passion or obfuscation in the case of people versus Merinilio. Impulse of zealous feeling, similar to passion or obfuscation. Now, these are based on decided cases. So, we shall agree on how to, on how did the court resolve them. You have their spread a core. Similar to passion or obfuscation. Now, this is especially true on uh, fraternities. So remember, you have there one time that the contending fraternities in the community, you have there the, the Acro and the Tau Gamma. They are really that loyal to their fraternity that if ever you hurt one of them, the rest of the group, would surely uh, attack you. So that is predator. Voluntary restitution of stolen property. We need to say you return the stolen property similar to voluntary surrender. Testifying for the prosecution without being discharged as a state witness. Okay, so you when it was your turn to testify, you did not admit when... Right away when the, the charge was read to you, you proceeded to trial, but when it was your turn to testify, you admitted to have done the, the act charge against you. 
So that is similar to plea of guilt. Extreme poverty and necessity. Similar to incomplete justifying based on state of necessity applicable only to crimes against property. So for example, a person committed death because he was so hungry. Okay, because of extreme poverty that he has no money to buy for his food. So that is analogous to um, incomplete justifying based on state of necessity. Those are the mitigating circumstances. Now on your screen, mitigating circumstances which are personally applicable only to that particular accused shall only be made to mitigate the liability of that particular accused. For example, A, B, and C took the bicycle of V. Of course, A, B, and C were charged for theft. It would appear that B took it uh, after the um it would appear that the the accused a here committed it out of vindication of a grave offense because he was angry at d to what d did to the mother of a so he has his own reason on the other hand b did it after he did it he surrendered right away but a and c fled from the crime scene and then let us say that c is a minor at the time of the commission of the crime but acted with discernment so what would be the effect as far as passion or obfuscation is concerned considering that that is personal to a then it would work to mitigate the liability of A because he committed it with passion or obfuscation. It will only be applicable to A only. How about the voluntary surrender did by B? Considering that it was B who did the voluntary surrender, that mitigating circumstance of voluntary surrender can only be made applicable to B, A and C cannot avail the same. Now, how about the minority of C? Since it was C who is only the minor, that minority that would serve to mitigate his liability would apply only to C because A and B are not minors. It is only true to C. In other words, those mitigating circumstances which arose from the moral attributes of the accused or it could be arising from his personal or private relations with the offended party or those arising from other personal causes are only made applicable to that particular accused only. To illustrate. From the accused, moral attributes. A and B killed C. A acting under an impulse which produced obfuscation. Said mitigating circumstance is applicable to mitigate the liability only of A. So the, the penalty, let's say they were charged for homicide and the court found them guilty by a no reasonable doubt. So you have the reclusion temporal which is the prescribed penalty for homicide. So, since homicide is a divisible penalty, and taking into consideration the mitigating circumstance of obfuscation as far as A is concerned, the penalty to be imposed upon A is reclusion temporal minimum period. How about B? The penalty to be imposed upon him shall be reclusion temporal medium period so i i i suppose you can still recall on the diagram i made on the board last time when we started with the 
mitigating circumstance and we made a distinction between ordinary and privileged mitigating circumstance. To illustrate accused private relations with the offended party, A, son of B, committed robbery against B, while C, a stranger, bought the property taken by A from B, knowing that the property was the effect of a crime of robbery. The circumstance of relationship of A to B serves to mitigate his criminal liability only and inapplicable as far as C is concerned because the relationship of A and B is personal to A only. Mitigating circumstance which arise from any other personal cause. A, a 16-year-old minor and acting with discernment inflicted serious physical injuries on C. B, seeing what A had done to C, kicked the latter thereby, concurring in the criminal purpose of A and cooperating with him by simultaneous act. Meaning to say, A and C here can be made criminally liable to what they did to... No, no, no. A and B can be made criminally liable to what they did to C. However, minority of A shall only be made applicable to A and does not apply to B, the accomplice of the crime. So that ends Article 13, Mitigating Circumstances.